What responsibility does the federal government have for the material well-being of the people? What authority does it possess to uphold such commitments? And if it is found to have both responsibility and authority, just how difficult is it for a modern moral society to provide a structure that fulfills these obligations? Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution states that Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Many progressives often point to this clause as the source of both the federal government's mandate to guard the general welfare and of their means to accomplish that purpose. Context from James Madison's Federalist 41 makes abundantly clear that he believes the existence of powers specifically enumerated to the federal government was intended to imply that other uses were to be considered unconstitutional. For what purpose, he says, could the enumeration of particular powers be inserted if these and all others were meant to be included in the preceding general power? Nothing is more natural nor common than first to use a general phrase and then to explain and qualify it by a recital of particulars. However, his Federalist paper partner, Alexander Hamilton, suggests elsewhere that the terms general welfare were doubtless intended to signify more than was expressed or imported in those which preceded. Otherwise, numerous exigencies incident to the affairs of a nation would have been left without a provision. Such was the case made by advocates of the New Deal during the height of the Great Depression in 1935. In response to the dire plight that many Americans found themselves in, the Roosevelt administration instituted a number of new programs which would become hallmarks of the federal government functions. The one we talk most about today is Social Security, but employment initiatives like the Works Progress Administration were more integral to fundamentally reshaping the way that American people viewed welfare. Providing government-sponsored work for people who were unemployed was a reflection of the culture at the time which would have regarded accepting handouts as dishonorable. It allowed for recipients to do something constructive and purposeful, while ensuring that they were still able to keep a roof over their heads, thus increasing widespread dependency on the government while maintaining the look of self-sufficiency. It was also at this time that the Supreme Court was forced to rule upon that centuries-old debate between Madison and Hamilton about the extent of the congressional spending power. An opinion by Justice Owen Roberts in the case United States v. Butler issued a stinging defeat for Madisonian restraint, concluding that the power of Congress to authorize expenditure of public monies for public purposes is not limited by the direct grants of legislative power found in the Constitution. The constitutional charge for the government to promote the general welfare was thus rendered a boundless license for politicians to rewrite American institutions through the power of government funding. This paved the way for President Johnson's Great Society, in which he endeavored to do just that. Under his administration, entitlement programs exploded in both size and scope. Many of these structures were formed with few requirements made of the recipient, instead relying upon the remaining vestiges of a culture that was reluctant to accept charity. As a result, many impoverished Americans who were eligible for such programs initially declined to take part. However, with the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and some encouragement from well-meaning government administrators, this reluctance shifted and the stigma surrounding accepting welfare evaporated. Suddenly, a system designed to provide for those in sudden, dire, or extreme circumstances was now expected to provide for many additional recipients. Ultimately, the 20th century demonstrated that the welfare experiment as a practical matter fell short. Analysts argue that this is not just because it was financially unsustainable or inefficient, it also managed to hurt those it was intended to help, while continuing to deplete the resources and goodwill of other Americans. Author Marvin Olasky, in his book The Tragedy of American Compassion, identifies three principal casualties of the so-called war on poverty, none of which are poverty itself. The first is the mechanisms of social mobility, meaning not that social mobility had become more difficult, but that people were less likely to pursue it. The second is the mission of private charities, who had sought to provide deeply personal and spiritually or psychologically enriching care, but were now supplanted by the apparatus of bureaucracy. The third is marriage and the family structure, and the incentives it provided to encourage strong childhood environments. Olasky observed that, prior to the 1960s, Marriage was both a social and an economic contract. Viewed in economic terms, it was a compassionate anti-poverty device that offered adults affiliation and challenge as it provided two parents for raising children. A well-intentioned campaign to reassure early recipients that their neediness was nothing to be ashamed of had gotten more than it bargained for. Progressives had crippled the very institutions they had set out to reinforce. 
Arthur C. Brooks suggests that the failure of Johnson's policies to achieve his stated ends stemmed from a failure to recognize a crucial distinction, the difference between complicated problems and complex problems. A complicated problem, he says, is technical and intricate, but objectively solvable by a learned professional and adequate resources. These are challenges like designing a jet engine or performing a successful heart transplant. A complex problem is one that is varied and indefinite. Regardless of how much experience or knowledge you possess about it, there is no scientific formula for repeatable success. Brooks uses the example of a football team. Even if you know what success, winning the game, looks like, and the basic abilities of your team, you cannot guarantee victory. Solving poverty, Brooks concludes, is a complex, not a complicated problem. Since the Johnson administration, this approach to public policy has only continued to grow, and expenditure has grown with it. From 1960 to 2021, federal welfare spending increased from $18 billion, adjusted for inflation, to over $1 trillion. Entitlement programs now account for nearly 50% of the federal budget. Yet, the poverty rate, which was on a downward trajectory when the war on poverty began in 1964, has barely budged since 1970. What entitlement programs have accomplished, however, is making large segments of the population dependent upon the government, making reducing or eliminating programs an endeavor fraught with political and social consequences. Whatever the founders may have envisioned, it seems the welfare state is here to stay, which raises the question, how can we find a way to target its provisions towards those who truly need it while incentivizing others to outgrow their dependence on it?